In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Praise be to Allah who made the Muslims the greatest community ever to be brought forth for humanity on the condition that they believe in Allah and join what is right and forbid what is wrong. Hello and welcome to Viewpoint. I'm Esther Nanetta Blatin and we're glad you could join us. Today we have an exclusive interview with Dr. Alan Sabrowski, U.S. Marine Corps veteran and a graduate of the U.S. War College Army, Michigan. Good morning, Dr. Sabrowski, and welcome to the program, sir. Good morning. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Dr. Sabrowski, your latest article t entitled Letting the Chiefs Fall Where They May, it's indeed an interesting one. Will you please elaborate on it, sir? What I found very interesting in the in the aftermath to the entire Gaza flotilla incident was Israel's decision to remove certain items from the list of embargo products that were being kept from the people of Gaza. Because very often what people do about those things will, will tell you something about their motivation. And I remarked on it that the, the items that the Israeli government were now allowing in included things like chocolate and candy and potato chips, and the title of chips falling where they may. And what what occurred to me was that this, this said a very great deal about the actual Israeli motivation for the embargo and the blockade, because the items that they were now allowing to be sent in could in no interpretation have had anything to do with either supporting Hamas as an organization or as a political movement or in providing some security for the people of Israel. I, I cannot see cookies and candy and potato chips being used for fortifications or weapons. And all they were intended to do was to make life miserable to the people of Gaza. It, is, it was a form of harassment, not, not even tangible damage, just harassment. The tangible damage, of course, was, was shattering the city and then precluding building supplies from coming back into it. But that said a great deal about the motivation for the Israelis, that this was a form of economic punishment, it was economic warfare, it was the collective punishment in large matters and small matters alike of the people of Gaza. And collective punishment, as I'm sure you understand, is, is contrary to international law. Yes, sir, thank you. And in your article, we learned, sir, that the Zionist regime announced their intention to ease the embargo against the Gaza Strip, and that they're going to permit the flow of goods like um, shaving cream, jam, fruit juice, soda, and potato chips, candies, and cookies. And what's your take on this, sir? I think there's going to be a very minor relaxation in the embargo on Gaza. The Israelis had, uh, had probably some of the worst public relations, even in the United States, with their effective control of the American media as a result of the confrontation with the flotilla, and particularly with, with the tur single Turkish ship. And they, they need to make some cosmetic changes, and it's those cosmetic changes are being given a, a great deal of play within the American media. But they are cosmetic because they don't fundamentally affect the goods that are allowed into the Gaza Strip. And also, since most of them come over the land border, these are things that the Israelis can and almost certainly will once again prohibit, once the, the world's attention shifts away from them. It's the, it's the sea blockade that's going to determine whether or not the blockade of Gaza succeeds or fails. And I think they understand that, because it, that the Israelis controlled most of the land, block entry points, there's a single entry point from Egypt, but that doesn't significantly affect things. And it's a sea that the confrontation is going to matter. And it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. We had spoken yesterday briefly on this, and I said, you know, one of the things that is, is very difficult for governments and political leaders 
everywhere to understand that while it may be attractive to do things unilaterally, it's much more effective to do things in concert with other countries. When after the after the Gaza flotilla incident, there was one ship, the Rachel Corey, which had arrived late and was heading toward the coast. And and I wrote to several of the organizers and to some of my friends who contact the organizers and I said, Wait, don't send it in. Wait until you can get a Turkey ship, perhaps an American flagship, and send them in together. Don't don't play to the Israeli strength, which is to take one opponent, one ship at a time. Give them several different opponents from several different countries and several different flags. Uh, and the same applies today. If there's an, an Iranian ship or an Italian ship or an Irish ship coming in alone to the Gaza Strip, it's very easy for the Israelis to stop it. It doesn't become an international incident. It really doesn't. Certainly not in the United States. But if there are several different ships from several different countries, you know, Iran, Turkey, Brazil, others, that makes an entirely different game. That brings different organizations into play, different alliances into play, complicates the Israeli life tremendously. Never never play to your enemy's strength. Never give your opponent the high ground. And that's what too many times the people who have attempted to break the blockade do. They play to Israel's strength. They send land convoys down and stop on the border and then get sent back to Jordan and back to Syria and finally dribble in. Or they go sailing up to the coast and, as with the Rachel Corey, I, we're here, yes, we surrender. does nothing. It does nothing. Yeah. Don't play to your enemy's strength. Play to your enemy's vulnerability. HTTP colon double backslash satv dot irib dot ir.